thanks for asking me to participate. I have one year yeah. in charge of developing program for the Soul Society in America. And everybody kept on asking, can we have a room assigned next to the coffee break room? And the idea is the highest attendance is in the room next to the coffee break. So I asked them, can they find a hotel where there is a, a central rooms and the middle of all of them equidistant distance in the coffee break. Well, I guess we are farther away, so we are very lucky we have good uh, attendance. Um, Dr. Von Braun asked me yesterday to explain very briefly what do we mean by soil degradation. So forgive me for preparing this handwritten note. I did have a PowerPoint, so I decided not to use it. Uh, soil degradation really is declining quality of soil, uh, its capacity to do some ecosystem functions, and uh, four types of uh, soil degradation that we know physical, which is structural degradation, soil structure, infiltration rate, uh, decline, crusting, compaction, reduction in available water capacity of the soil, of course, uh, infiltration decline lead to runoff, and of course, erosion. Uh, so these are some of the examples of physical degradation. Uh, then there's a chemical degradation. And the chemical degradation is uh, acidification, when the pH goes down, uh, salinization, when salt concentration goes up, nutrient imbalance, for example, we subsidize nitrogen but not phosphorus, so farmer applies nitrogen and phosphorus is depleted, or there may be micronutrient deficiency, or elemental toxicity, aluminum, uh, manganese, iron, may become toxic concentration. There's a biological degradation when there's a depletion of soil organic matter content because soil organic carbon, loss of biodiversity, earthworm population, microbial biomass carbon, that would be biological. And then there's an ecological degradation, which is not very often used, but nutrient cycling, water cycling, energy balance problems, albedo differences, soil temperature differences. Uh, these are kind of, uh, so the question really is, uh, when do you measure the question, how much is the soil degradation? Well, it depends on what you want to monitor, what you want to measure. And that reminds me of three statements which normally people make. Uh, what some people say, what can't be measured cannot be managed. <laughs> and I guess if you were to measure something in soil degradation, then you figure out what your problem is. And I think of Peter Deming, who was a business uh, CEO, and he said, wait a minute, what cannot be measured must be managed. So, I think you can apply both of those and well, if you can't measure these, but don't forget, management is, is very critical. So, the soil quality index then is on the basis of defining what key properties are really important to quantify soil degradation and those key properties are not universal. It depends on what kind of degradation problem. So, I have listed a few, for example, soil quality index is a function of carbon in soil, but density, available water capacity, infiltration rate, nutrient, extra, whatever that might, and develop that index. Uh, Cornell has one index, I developed one for tropical soil, but the, the major factor in that is defining the critical limits. What is the critical limit beyond which the soil is degraded? And if you do not know that critical limit, then the measurement becomes irrelevant, and the critical limits change to change in land use. If you have arable land use versus pastoral land use versus tree land use, the critical limits are different. So that's really where the major science of soil degradation rests and what we need to quantify. And when people say there's not enough data, that's what we are talking about. What are the properties, what are the critical limits, what are the strategies, and how they change. Then if you have soil degradation and supposing our function that we are interested in is productivity, whether it's biomass, whether it's grain, whether it's whatever you want to call it, economic. So if you have a productivity loss, you have 100% loss, you have 0%, here might be soil A, it very quickly becomes degraded to such a level that the productivity loss will not come. And a soil in Nigeria, which after first year, we lost all the top soil above the late right layer, 100% productivity loss come. So in one, two, three, four, or five years, the soil is gone. There might be soil B, which has a deep soil profile and its productivity can stay for a long time. Or, it may be the same soil type and this is a management A and this is a management B. So, if the management B which you are looking for, so its productivity decline is not very rapid. That's a sustainable management versus a poor management. 
So it could be soil A versus soil B or a sustainable management versus extractive farm. So the choice then becomes what is a sustainable management or what is the best soil type for a given land use that you want to manage. And that is the choice you make on the basis of those criteria. The last one which is very critical, uh, which I wanted to share with you for my time, was uh, the concept that look, uh, Gnazia and uh, UNCCD has put out zero net land degradation. The idea is to restore the land which is degraded so that the net loss of arable land is zero. Well then the question is, what kind of response function does the soil have? So I put in here a time on the x-axis and the productivity on the y-axis, in this case, compared to the previous graph, I got 100% productivity half. So let's say a, a soil follows over a time period this black line that I've drawn as a productivity curve. So a soil may be slightly degraded at x time, 5 year, 10 year, whatever the time scale is, and it is slight because the decline in production is about 10%. <coughs> so you can still get, that there may be another stage of degradation where the decline is 25 percent. Uh, it may become severely degraded when the decline is perhaps 50 percent. And it may become strongly degraded when the decline is 75 percent. And it may be irreversibly degraded, extreme degradation, when the soil cannot be restored at all. For example, I'm talking about the, all the topsoil is gone, you cannot do much about it. Now, at a given point in time, if you change the land use, say the soil was degrading and the farm management says, I'm going to change from plow tail to no tail, or I'm going to change from a, a cropping, row cropping to a cover crop or to a permanent culture or pasture or something, then the productivity increases slowly happen. Initially there may be no change and after some time the productivity goes up, but it does not follow the same path. And this when it doesn't follow the same path in soil scientific species. In one, the soil is hysteretic. Sometimes people call it hysteric, no, it's not hysteric. So, so, so that part. Now, when the soil is moderately degraded, this length of time in which it doesn't, nothing happens, even when you are putting the input, that's when people say, well, I converted from plow tail to no tail, and nothing happened first two years. Of course, the soil is degraded. So, uh, this time period lengthens. And as you go to the severely degraded, that time for which the soil does not respond even becomes longer. So, it becomes very difficult. I think the question is the cost of no action becomes really much more severe because it, and you come a time when really the period is so long that nobody can afford to continue waiting for it to respond. This is really the basic <coughs> concept of why we do not have a critical handle on the extent and severity of degradation. So the question that I was asking in the beginning, what do you do in a situation like this? Do you wait until you reach this level? or do you want to take care of the problem when you're that level? This is where you need to know the critical limits of the property you have to Otherwise, you cannot answer that. And this is also where, as far as the soil degradation is concerned, prevention is always better than the restoration. Always. It is too late and too expensive. It's like dollar short and day late, that situation. And I think that is where many places I have seen so all have gone to this stage and then we say, let's restore and do zero net land degradation, not possible. Thank you so much. Uh, this was, uh, I think, very helpful. Let's keep in mind, as economists, that we have to have a, a time subscript in mind. Um, otherwise, uh, um, it's not just action versus inaction, or cost of action versus uh, cost of action. It is also when. So, um, uh, and I think this was a very important message, which I think has not been mentioned clearly uh, before, uh, at least in the sessions I have been um, listening. Um, I'm sure we come back to a uh, few questions. I would like to have all statements, all four statements first, and then we can discuss. Uh, as in the program, next speaker, uh, they all have the instructions, seven minutes, no more. Um, and if PowerPoint, seven PowerPoint slides, no more. Uh, 
Stefan Schmitz, Dr. Stefan Schmitz, uh, I mentioned already, is uh, head of the Division of Rural Development and Food Security in the German Ministry for Development, for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, he had been before with uh, OECD in Paris, um, related to uh, the work on managing for development results. Actually, I shouldn't forget those principles. Uh, that's uh, very important for our agenda here. Um, he had experience in China. Uh, university education relates to geography, mathematics, geoscience um, in Bonn and Berlin. Um, Stefan, you have the floor. Um, yes, thank you very much. I will keep it uh, very brief. Um, the, uh, the topic of this particular session here is um, uh, vision and strategies on, on uh, sorry, well, vision first. That's the point where. Oh, yeah. That's the point uh, where I um, come from. My vision. My vision is um, healthy soils will feed the world. Um, we already heard that yesterday. Uh, we are expecting a global population of nine million and uh, nine billion in 2050. Um, but due to a growing appetite uh, for meat and eggs, uh, uh, instead of just potatoes, rice and bread, uh, these 9 billion will demand as much food and feed as 12 billion people would do given today's consumption better. You should keep that in mind. It's quite um, it is precisely this alarming forecast that brings international organizations, politicians and agro-industry to jointly urge for global increase in agricultural pro uh, production. And it's quite right that they do so. This call is justified. But given the fact that soil, the world's most important production base, is banished very rapidly, I ask, isn't it strange that hardly anybody beyond our scene here, hardly anybody urges for the conservation of soil and its fertility? Every hectare of soil that is degraded and lost implies increased pleasure, uh, pressure on the remaining fertile grounds to feed the world. That means even more fertilizer, more demand for high yield crops, more water, higher temptation to apply unsustainable forms of land use. So the higher the degree of unsustainable land use, the higher the risk of soil degradation, a vicious circle. Soils are tremendous carbon uh, sinks. Soils that are not managed properly release plenty of greenhouse gases. Again, one should ask, isn't it strange that hardly anybody urges for the conservation of soils? Soils feed the world and soils defend the earth from even higher climate risks. Neglecting soils means missing opportunities for global food security and for global climate protection as well. So that's my point of departure. Soils are exactly the one medium that should link our ambition for millennium development goals and sustainable development goals. Um, well, when it comes to, to strategies, from vision, from visions to, to strategies, against all these backgrounds, uh, the current global architecture to deal with soils is completely inadequate. One could even say such a global architecture is virtually non-existent. Today, climate change and loss of biodiversity are on the global agenda. Soil degradation is not. Don't get me wrong. This is not a call for any kind of new convention or international legally binding instrument. That was discussed extensively yesterday in the opening. That's, that's not the point here. This is a call for more global networking. Networking of, of like-minded, for more initiatives raising public and political awareness, for more research that provides the evidence base for better soil policy, that provides results ready-made for policy making. The Global Soil Week is exactly that kind of forum that is able to fill this gap. And I'm convinced that the ELD initiative, we are talking this afternoon in the same way is the right initiative to fill this gap. And when these 
to, to initiate two things, the Global Soil Week and the ELD initiative uh, fits very, very well um, uh, together. Um, I remember um, uh, Professor Lau, uh, we, we had invited him to, to come to, to Bonn to, to an international conference uh, last year, exactly a year ago. And he at that time gave a very uh, impressive uh, presentation. At that, that time it was a PowerPoint presentation, I remember. Uh, on global, global soil initiative we witnessed over the last decades. And a long, long list of soil initiatives. They all emerged and they all disappeared without hardly any, any impact. That was very, very uh, uh, impressive for me. Uh, without hardly any impact. Too much lip service and political rhetoric, too little link with evidence-based sound experience and practice, too little link with modern kinds of public relations that are able um, to carry the messages to a broader public. Um, so, again, again, this background, BMZ, German Development Cooperation, is one of the founding members, the founding partners of this BLD uh, initiative that was uh, officially launched uh, at the UN General Assembly uh, last year. Germany, next to the European Commission and the, the UN uh, Convention to Combat uh, Desertification, we, uh, we three are the, the, the founding partners. And we now we are very uh, very happy that um, uh, Professor von Braun, together with uh, his team at ZEF, um, plays a prominent role uh, in this initiative. Uh, ELD is to create awareness for the economic benefits derived from land use, to highlight the growing costs of land degradation, and to draw together expertise from the fields of science, economics, and policy to enable practical action moving forward. To mitigate the growing issue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much and I think it's also important that you reminded us of uh, uh, the fate of initiatives uh, coming and going and uh, I actually was uh, glad to see that Jordan Lau didn't put up this slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no, let's, uh, let's not forget that. Let me add another remark. If I were a soil scientist who had offered his productive life to, to the health of soils, I would be a bit upset about these economists who come through the side door and say, hey, you have to also quantify the economic issues. Um, uh, otherwise, your science initiatives will not have the impact with those who um, who you want to invest in healthy soils for for food security, the, uh, the logo which uh, Stefan Schmitz has uh, put up. Let me assure you that uh, these economists who come through the side door and argue uh, that they have a role to play in this uh, uh, in this field of uh, sustainable land use and preventing degradation can only be successful if they work together with the soil scientists. I think that needs to be emphasized uh, time and again. Um, uh, the leadership must be collective, in my opinion. And uh, Little Ceph is only one science player. Uh, it's great that, um, as we hear initiative, you have uh, Abroad about the ELD Secretariat. Um, uh, Dr. Schauer will make a, a few remarks towards the end uh, how he sees the next step and so on. Let me now introduce um, a key player in the field of making things visible, um, putting them on the map, figuratively speaking. Uh, Luca Montanarella. Uh, is the head of the new JRC Action Soil Data and Information Systems, abbreviated, of course, SOIL, yeah, Soil Data and Information Systems. Um, he is at JRC ISPRA, Italy, who hasn't visited uh, ISPRA 
find an excuse to go and visit Luca. It's a, a, a fabulous science center. How many are you? 2,000 people there? You see, you won't feel lonely in the uh, beautiful lake districts of Upper Italy. But these are people uh, who, and, and Luca in particular, who innovate in developing the world soil maps, the European soil maps, the change of these maps. Um, it's fundamental research without which we cannot monitor, evaluate and see progress or lack thereof. Luca, yes, uh, Thank you for the kind introduction and of course Already there is an applause, so I all, uh, I all invite you to join us in this committee at the next ELD meetings or sessions. Um, as you said, um, I'm leading at the Commission this activity on soils and soil data and information since several years. Um, I'm not alone in the room, there is my colleague Michiel Charlet, who is also in our team and he is the ELD expert in our team, so if you have ELD related questions, please. He was our man. I will tell you just a little bit more in general what my experience has been with economics and what um, my vision is out of my experience of being quite actively involved in developing the EU policy on soils, particularly the EU soil thematic strategy and uh, the experience we have gained out of that uh, concerning economics of uh, soil. I call it soil degradation, but I may be come back then on the soil and land uh, discussion. Um, I was quickly scanning the document, by the way, it was, uh, the first thing that struck me was the uh, thing that you want to go beyond market value of land or soil, which is already a very interesting thing, because we were having even difficulties in the EU and Europe to grasp market values. Uh, as you know, we don't have a EU wide since we're talking of data, and I think market values are sort of data. Um, any means to have an overview of what the market values are in different member states and what the current price trends are for land and soil. So we have there already a difficulty. By the way, very strangely, because uh, for the ones of you who are familiar with Europe, uh, soil mapping in Europe has been established in many of these countries, many years ago for the only purpose that we wanted to have a taxation system based on soil properties. Uh, particularly this country which is hosting us now is famous for having developed this for that purpose uh, in the 30s and this uh, taxation system used to be based on soil properties uh, because uh, good soil should uh, produce more and bad soil should produce less and so of course there's a link here already to economics. But you want to go beyond that and actually, when we were designing the soil thematic strategy, we also wanted to go beyond that. And uh, we were thinking uh, to make a distinction uh, between property, uh, right, uh, let's say land property, and soil functions. Let me briefly explain uh, that in Europe, the vast majority of land is in private property. Um, and obviously, if you want to legislate about it, you must start thinking how you want to address this fact. And of course, uh, we have put the emphasis on the fact that uh, there may be land in private property, but that there are soil functions which have a common um, benefit. So something that soils deliver to all of us, even though soils are in private property. And this distinction is crucial. So we never said we want to protect soils. We always said we want to protect soil functions. And uh, there was a long debate which soil functions. We have identified in the EU seven soil functions, but at global level we will find others. Um, and this distinction is crucial because that makes us, gives us the possibility to add a value to land, but then also to find out what is the added value provided by these soil functions. And so, obviously then, once you want to quantify what is the actual cost to the society of the fact that we are losing these soil functions, uh, this will allow you to have a quantitative terms in economic terms of the overall uh, economics, so going beyond market value. Uh, I must tell you that, um, uh, I don't know if you know, any legislative proposal in the European Union needs to be associated with an extended impact assessment. Uh, uh, just to explain, an extended impact assessment is nothing else than the economic evaluation 
uh, why we need legislation. Uh, we did one for the soil thematic strategy and it was highly criticized because of course it was very difficult in 2006 to make a full economic evaluation of the cost of inaction and of the cost of action. We had a, a, a range of values that we have found, for example, for the cost to the European citizen for soil erosion, which was enormous. It's very difficult to attach figures to that because it's very difficult to find data and information on this type of costs. So there is a lot of improvement possible in the evaluation of the economics, and uh, we were um, one of the strong, or the, the, one of the argumentations still stopping the establishment of a soil framework directive in the EU is that there is the argumentation that it would cost too much, in the sense that the cost to uh, the member states in implementing such a legislation would be higher than the benefit to the citizen of this legislation. So again, it's a purely cost-related issue. Uh, it should be said that one of the biggest costs uh, that we uh, were estimating was the cost of remediating contaminated sites. This may be a, a purely European-specific issue that we have uh, uh, an old heritage of industry and industrial activities that, of course, is a tremendous cost burden to remediate. So just uh, these are a few of our, our experiences in this issue. Uh, uh, we would really love to have uh, a better economics of land degradation. I'm talking just of the European perspective, I'm sure globally there are other perspectives. So for us in Europe, we are really still struggling to attach uh, figures uh, and, and precise cost figures to all these processes. So I'm very happy to be here and looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much. Uh, uh, a lot of this variation will require not just statistics but modeling. And we need to come back uh, probably in the next uh, two panels uh, to this. Um, uh, let me move on and introduce uh, our fourth and final speaker uh, who has now joined the panel, uh, Janil Puzo Nubotawa. Uh, Janil is an economist um, by education, uh, got a PhD in economics, um, State Management University, Moscow. Work experience at the Kyrgyz Academy, um, and uh, she has actually been involved quite a bit in um, uh, uh, issues of degradation. Uh, collaborated with UNCCD uh, for quite some time and uh, joined an organization called uh, Camp Alto. It's a foundation by the director of Camp Alto. Could you say us in, in, in your own words uh, a few things when you start what uh, Camp Alto is doing uh, precisely? Um, you come from mountain state Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and um, a country rich in mountains, uh, lots of water, uh, but um, in a difficult environment um, where the protection of, uh, uh, of environment, land and soil is, is critical. Um, we look forward to your intervention. Thank you. for Kyrgyz uh, Public Foundation, Kempalato, uh, which was uh, created and framed 
as the successor of the camp program in Central Asia. Camp means Central Asia Mountain Partnership Program, which was funded was funded by SDC and uh, uh, developed in three countries: Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. And local um, team decided to continue to work with the mountain communities based on uh, sustainable use of natural resources, and we created local institutions as public foundation and called it Camp Alator. Alator means, means colorful mountains. And uh, regarding my presentation, I would like to uh, present you our experience, experience which we got in the frame of the work on sustainable pasture management. Uh, we developed this approach uh, for, uh, for our country and already adapted it for uh, neighboring countries. And I would like to present you one, two of this approach. Uh, and call it my presentation as economic incentive for the sustainable pasture use in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is one of the um, uh, CIS countries uh, which is located in the Central Asia. And uh, uh, the, um, the 93 um, percentage of uh, territory are covered by the mountain. And the population of Kyrgyzstan consists of uh, more than 5 million people. And the most of them are dealing with uh, live, uh, livestock. And the, so they depend on the pasture conditions. And the herders uh, use uh, pastures a uh, whole year. And you could see this uh, type of pasture which, which we have. And at the moment, unfortunately, the conditions of pasture are not so good. You could see that we have this, um, uh, we have winter pasture, summer pasture, and spring and autumn pasture, and the level of the degradation. And uh, this means desertification, uh, uh, this is beginning of degradation, and this is non-degraded pasture. Uh, this is um, official data, uh, which are not Mm, uh, real, unfortunately, the real si situation is worse. Uh, and uh, we mm, have a pasture reform. Uh, we got new law, pasture law, at the beginning of 2009. And in accordance with this law, the empowerment for pasture management was given on the local level to the local governors. And uh, local governments uh, at the same time give this uh, empowerment to the uh, Pasture Users Association. And Pasture Users Association in each uh, local province uh, uh, elected pasture committees, which uh, are executive body on the local level. And each pasture committee should have the budget. And you could see the example of yearly budget of pasture committee, which consists of different items like uh, expenses for the improvement of uh, and maintenance, maintenance of pasture infrastructure, uh, expenses for uh, pasture improvement, for elaboration of uh, grazing plan, for assessment of pasture carrying capacity, for monitoring of the implementation of grazing plan, for salary of pasture committee mem members, and etc. So, <clears throat> based on this bu budget, we developed the um, 
economic incentive for sustainable use of seasonal pastures. So uh, we based on the number of grazing days, on the number of the livestock units, and uh, uh, calculate the pasture use fees uh, per livestock and per season for winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And you could see that the, uh, the highest uh, fear is in winter time. And the winter pastures are more degraded at the same time. So uh, this uh, um, pasture use fears could be economical instrument for the sustainable uh, use of pasture, so to decrease the number of livestock in the water. Uh, but of course it's not uh, real today, but it, uh, we hope that it will come. And uh, already today we have good examples, for example in the Sharp uh, municipality, in Osh province, in south of Kyrgyzstan, the pasture committee uh, they cal Sorry. Uh, the pasture committee they calculated the uh, uh, local fear for pasture uh, use. Uh, it's okay. I use this way. They calculated uh, pasture fee, fee as 100 uh, uh, Kyrgyz song per year, but there are unused pastures. And to motivate people to use it, they decided to, uh, uh, they decided how to manage it. Uh -huh. They decided to they decided to uh, uh, decrease the pasture fee for uh, unused pastures till 50 Kyrgyz son per year, and to increase the pasture fee uh, for um, near village pastures till 300 son, and it works people started to use unused pastures. So we uh, hope that uh, it will work in future better, because now pasture committees became the real institution, and the pasture users, they uh, began to uh, pay, for the, uh, pay for this pasture use. So, and uh, we think that uh, um, the cause of prevention uh, pasture degradation uh, is smaller than uh, the cost of rehabilitation already of degraded pastures. And uh, um, it's a supportive measure for the attaining zero net land degradation in uh, our case too. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, already helpful. We will have other examples later on in the country-specific session. But I felt it was very good to have a concrete example uh, how uh, how to deal with land, land use and what incentives can make a difference uh, right here in this first uh, session. Um, Colleagues, while you are getting ready for questions, let me make one um, simple and straightforward theoretical observation. Um, we got uh, a challenge from uh, Ratan and from Luca regarding the curves of degradation over time and what they mean for, for value. Um, that means we have to Think about um, optimization of, uh, of uh, uh, preventing degradation 
and derive a first and second derivatives from these curves. It's not points, it not, it's not lines, it's curves. Otherwise we cannot um, um, find optimal, optimal, optimal levels of uh, investment. Uh, if, we, if we don't consider these curves, um, uh, and if we don't consider uh, the marginal value of, uh, uh, of uh, land productivity change, uh, not just the average, as, as Luca has pointed out, and if we exclude um, the indirect effects, well, we fail as economists. So uh, I just wanted to point out, let's start thinking about these basic concepts. By now you have questions um, to our panelists, or comments. Um, please um, go ahead. Yes. And Michael is coming. Michael is coming. Jürgen Fechter, KFW. Rather, I'm a little bit disappointed yesterday I heard you doing linear numbers and said everything can be based on soil organic matter and it sounded for me very easy to estimate and today you're explaining exactly the, the opposite. Can you help me a little bit? Yes, I got caught. She's in a different room. <laughs> it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an adaptive That's a very good question. The list, the list of the variables I have put in there is practically impossible to <coughs> So you are really looking for one or two key variables that also moderate and regulate other variables. So if I were to pick up one property that affects many things, but is not 100% correct, then that's organic matter content. Why? Because organic matter content affects bulk density, it affects soil structure, it affects uh, water retention capacity, it affects nutrient reservoir. So it is one variable in which if I have limited resources to monitor, I could do that. But that does not mean that that's the only thing that you can do. If I have to pick two variables, I'll probably pick up, and if it's sub-Saharan Africa, I'll probably pick organic matter and available water capacity. If I have to pick three variables, then I'll add nutrient reserves into it. If I have to pick four variables, then look at erodibility and infiltration rate. And I think this is the way to go. But if I have limited resources and I have to quantify the susceptibility of a soil to physical degradation, chemical degradation, and biological degradation, and ecological degradation, one variable which comes to the top is our demand. And I would add, we need to start with doable things. And then, as we progress, become more complicated. If we start with the most complex approaches, we will not succeed. And we will confuse policymakers and investors more than we get them on board through combining our, our ideas. I saw a hand up there, then Ephraim, and then... Thank you, La. Today's presentation, you really uh, educated me on the critical uh, definition of land degradation that we have to talk about a critical level. And that's to my class here to pay $2,000 tuition fee. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, but I think there is something else which, are, again, this is from your own presentation, which are always very educative to me. You, you always say that everything is connected to something else. And uh, I think that uh, a, a reason for us to define land degradation in more generic form, uh, the Millennium Ex Ecosystem Services defines land degradation as the loss of ecosystem services. Now, given that, and given what Joachim said, that we talk of land degradations, meaning that we are partitioning them. So, I want you to talk about that again. <laughs> well, um, the previous question was, what variable you want to monitor for soil degradation? And we had an inner problem. When people about, talk about land degradation, I really have nightmares to be honest with you. Because land is a uh, climate, land is vegetation, land is hydrology, land is fauna, both above ground and below ground, and land is soil. Soil is a component of land. All the other components are there also. 
So for my simplicity, I have enough problem with dealing with soil degradation. When it comes land, you really have a complex issue. So auto, if you really want to call it land degradation, are you going to talk about difference between soil and land? I forgot to say. Yeah. No, <laughs> you say, you say okay. Um, if you really want to make a distinction between uh, soil and land, let's say you want to go to land degradation, then I will uh, there also define what is the key component of those five. So if you remember uh, Rainer Horn had today biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and lithosphere, and pedosphere was in the middle. So the middle part, pedosphere, is what I talked about. The other sphere, hydrosphere, biosphere, which is vegetation, lithosphere, which is the parent material, another part were not. So in the land, then you have to really go to this site and find out what one component is most critical. If you want to go beyond one, maybe the vegetation adding the third one. If you want to go further, maybe add a hydrology into that one. If you want to go even further, add micro and mesoclimate. So it's a how much sugar you want to add to keep your tea sweetener. And that's that it's really very complex. Okay. Uh, Uh, my name is Michael Obersteiner. I'm one of these economists who walk through the, the side door and uh, do impact assessment for the European Commission. Uh, one thing what we found out with the many impact assessments we did is uh, that the very basic data sets we are working with uh, uh, only lend themselves to stratos economics, so it's very kind of uh, airy kind of business because the uncertainties are so big. But then what we did is we actually calculated the value of information of better soil information, land cover information. And what we found is that uh, the benefits of better policies based on better data are actually of orders of magnitudes larger than the costs of production. So uh, could you please help me why this is not happening if money is actually on the ground? Okay, would you come? Oh, yeah. It's very simple, uh, and it brings me back to this curve, by the way. Uh, we are not able to demonstrate that because there's this curve, there is a change in the market value of that piece of land. This will depend on the function that you want to promote. I give you there are many examples. I mean, if on, on a piece of land you want to put housing and infrastructure, and you have erosion, all kind of things that we are talking here, it will not change the value of the land, actually. Actually, it will may, it may be even make it more easily used for other applications. So, we have here a mismatch between the data we collect on the economic side and the data we collect on the, on the, the biophysical, physical, natural side. Then, there is an issue uh, and that the co collecting data on soils is very expensive. Okay? Um, we launched last uh, 2009 a data collection exercise all over Europe on 22,000 points called Lucas Soil. Not because I'm <laughs> Lucas, uh, Lucas stands for Land Use Land Cover uh, Area <laughs> Service. Just to be clear. Uh, uh, and, and your parents had in mind. Yeah, and, 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 and this cost uh, already uh, 1.6 million euros, which is just 22,000 points, which is nothing. So. Uh, you see, the point is soils, definitely you need to dig a hole to see it. So you need to go, just to make the distinction between land and soil, you must go beyond the surface. So it means you must send somebody which has experience to dig a profile, to look at it, to describe it, to measure. This costs money. Per point it costs roughly 2,000 euros. So who should pay for it? And uh, how you do you then transfer this cost to the person who is benefiting from it. Because, as you say, there is a definite benefit in basing legislation on good data. But who is benefiting? It? This is the question. And if you say it's the general taxpayer, especially the German taxpayer, benefiting from it, uh, we are still not convincing enough to the German taxpayer that this is worse. So, uh, and this is one of the problems we have. So, um, we are essentially navigating without having any data. Uh, I must be very frank. We don't know about degradation processes in Europe. We don't know about prices of land in Europe. We don't know about functions of sorts in Europe. We know very, very, very little. Uh, using again and again the same data recycled with a new model. Uh, this is the classic. Uh, I don't have to explain it to you, Michael. Uh, uh, so uh, 
There is here an issue that the modeling community has taken over compared to the data collection community because data collection is extremely boring, is extremely costly and doesn't produce many scientific publications. So there is here a key issue uh, in an environment in where state organizations that were delegated to data collection have been more or less disbanded in many member states. Uh, we simply don't have anymore any mean to grasp reality. And I think this is treating many people. Uh, it's much better not to know than to know uh, in many cases for many reasons. And so I think we, we must go back to this curve, but to describe this curve you need a lot of data points because as you say it's a curve. So, uh, and this is, I'm um, afraid, possible in few sites, but systematically over Europe, and I'm just talking about the European Union, it's very difficult. And what would it cost for the European Union to do the dynamic mapping of the type of soil degradation and soil status which you would dream of? What does it, what's the price tag? Uh, as I told you, it costed to go once on 22,000 points which is a grid uh, all over Europe on a grid sp spacing of, uh, well, let's say 10 kilometers, 1.6 million euros. So if you want to go over time, because this is a time, mm -hmm. uh, you will must, uh, will have to go back to these points every five years, let's say. So this is the price. And most people are strongly criticize what we do because they say 22,000 points, come on, this is nothing. Uh, I say, I dig a hole here and then I dig a hole there, and there is already a difference, so, yeah, that's the beauty of soils, they are not all the same. <laughs> Would the price in Africa be roughly the same? Uh, Africa has a fantastic system called the African Soil Information Service, which is doing this for 18 million dollars, thanks to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, so uh, uh, they're doing a lot, much more than in Europe, I would say. Oh, okay. Um, I had, I've seen you had your hand up, Rotten, but there were at least two who want to turn say something. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Derek Eaton from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in uh, Geneva. Uh, I have to confess I'm also a side door economist. I suppose that's better than being a back door <laughs> economist. Uh, and I, it's actually perhaps a follow up question. I'm not sure if my question was really answered uh, by by the last one in your response, Luca, but uh, when you describe the EU as struggling with, uh, with this economic analysis and in particularly going beyond the market value, and now you've just given some estimates of what the costs, would, uh, what the costs are for, uh, for, for monitoring uh, soil, uh, is, is, it those to, is it fundamentally to do this type of analysis uh, an issue of, of, of resources? Or is there something that you've seen already that is also fundamental intractability of, of, of this that we can, we can tro try and go after as much data and information as we like, but the, the situation is so complex, the soil is different here from there, that, that perhaps we're setting up a, a goal that, that's almost uh, too hard to reach. I'm not sure, I'm just wondering if, if, if in your sense, it is, if we just had the resources, we would get there. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, in reality I have not been telling you the real reason. Uh, 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 the real reason is that soils is a national issue. Yeah, a private issue, uh, a very sensitive issue. Um, and and uh, it goes back to my distinction between soil and soil functions. Um, it's very annoying if the European Commission goes around Europe and digs a hole here and there and collects information. Uh, this is something that should be done at national level. Uh, and we are encouraging member states to do it and to report to us this type of data. Unfortunately, it's not happening consistently all over Europe. Uh, so it's, it's not really what we should do. And the other thing is that um, the other difficulty is that there is not a full recognition that uh, the soil functions uh, for a public good, that, you know, um, we, we need to collect data about functions that are good for all of us, like, for example, filtering ground, filtering water, so the buffering capacity of soils. This means that we have now here clean drinking water because some soil has been filtering it, and it has been filtering it probably on private land. 
but the water that was coming out is now used by others uh, to drink. So uh, we need to introduce this concept that we need to collect data not because we want to infringe private property rights, but because we want to collectively uh, manage better something that is collectively valuable. And uh, this message is still not coming through very, very, very clearly. And, um, so it's not not uh, a proper thing to do to go in private land, dig, take a soil sort of sample, and, and analyze and study what it's doing. By the way, the soil data we collect are not publicly available exactly for this reason that we cannot put public results of point data because we are collecting data on private land and uh, it cannot be put public because it infringes privacy of, of landowners. So. Uh, there is here an issue that if you want to deal with this issue from the economic terms, you're entering into the private ownership issues. And, and, and so we need to distinguish this from the public goods that are delivered by sorts that go beyond, uh, beyond market value, if I can say so. Yeah. Thank you. I want to give one last uh, voice to the audience. And we have three more panels to go. So hold back and... Uh, uh, let's move fast, uh, Professor Howe. And then I turn back to our panelists and uh, move on to the next panel. Yeah, my name is Werner Horn. I'm not an economist, but I just simple, I'm a simple soil scientist. <laughs> uh, so that's that's why I always a bit of struggling. Degradation, you, what time you also told it, okay, degradation is highly complex. But let's let's start to, to try to get an idea about Complexity, is, we can always hide behind that. But if we try to get a, some, somebody convinced what is the value, what is the, yeah, what is the value of a soil, do we have any, any data sets, what is the cost, let's say, for example, for build, filtering and buffering, what is the cost of, or what is the, what is the input by, by microbes or whatsoever, biological activity in the soil, what we use, and which is then degraded by or reduced by degradation. Are there data on that available? And I think we could, well, your, your lines are quite nice and your curves are well understood. I'm, I'm sure you are completely right, but we I think we don't get anybody body behind the, the, the uh, auto, uh, this auto skirt. Uh, in the system, if we cannot tell, come on, like that. So the quantification, I was a bit surprised myself when I told in the morning, pay attention, 200 billion euro just simply for soil loss, 100 hectare per year for one, per day for one year. That's what we lose as, an, as a value. So can we not start on that? What is the filtering, buffering? What is the cost for, for let's say, uh, Water, water infiltration or microbial activity, is there no chance? I, I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, let me return to the panelists in the order as they spoke, and uh, um, they can. Uh, I will turn to Stefan first. Um, Stefan, your vision healthy soils will feed the world it has not been contested. Um, would you like to react to any of the discussions which you have heard? I mean, after all, uh, you are listening uh, here in as one of the policy makers who need to be able to absorb and make something good out of it, what we are mm -hmm. debating. Um, uh, feel free to be as critical as you like. No. I think there is no reason for me to be critical at that uh, point. In, indeed, nobody contested um, uh, my, my vision. I'm, I'm, I'm not sitting here as, as a soy scientist, I come from the policy side, uh, seeing, seeing the need for that kind of research that can be used within political debates and political dialogue. And I'm very happy to see this kind of debate growing here. So um, that's, as I said before, the reason why we are funding this whole, this whole <coughs> initiative, uh, the a part of the research work, um, uh, the secretariat for that. And uh, I think, uh, well, I hope that it's a good, a, good, a good start what we are doing here and that, um, that you and others took the opportunity here to use 
the Global Soil Week as an excellent platform to present and discuss this initiative. Because as I, as I said before, I think there, there is a very close link between the intention of the Global Soil Week on the one hand and the intention, the, the aims of this uh, economics of land degradation initiatives. These two things go very good together and uh, um, what, I, what I experience here over the, over the cafe um, uh, convinced me that we are on the right on track. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Rainer, I think uh, you are very right, absolutely correct. Although the impression given here is that soil degradation is too complex, uh, I was asked by Professor Von Braun to explain, you know, this thing. Now, should it be done? Of course. Should it be simplified? Definitely. Let me give you an example. Um, in Ohio, we have a Miamian soil, a soil which covers 70% or 60% of Ohio, at the same states, Indiana and so forth. The whole of the United States can be divided into 37 biomes. Biome is land, climate, water and soil, what you call them together. So pick up those. So we could select benchmark sites where you find the dominant degradation process, address that and extrapolate. And that's the way it has to be handled. There is, like somebody asked me a question yesterday, we got one and a half billion small farmer of one acre, can we go and monitor carbon in each land? Absolutely not. <laughs> So you have a surrogate method of doing those things. So these problems, the theoretical part is one part. Addressing practical problems, simplifying it, extrapolating, and sticking your neck out and saying, this result is applicable on this area. And that's the way to move forward. So I would love and welcome to work with economists on simplifying this, but at the same time to explain to you that there are basic processes behind soil degradation which are much more complex. So as student of soil science, they have to study that. But from the economics point of view, from assessment, what does it take to do that? Of course we got to work with you to simplify those things. And that's what we will do. Thank you. Luca. I've been already talking too much, by the way. Uh, uh, just a few things that uh, are my dream are to collect hard data on economic aspects of soils. I'll just give you a few examples of the things we didn't succeed to collect. Um, I mentioned the market values all over Europe, which is difficult to get. But another thing we would like to get from the electrical companies, for example, their cost of um, siltation of uh, hydropower reservoirs, which is correlated to soil erosion processes which would give us hard figures of what is the cost to them due to soil erosion in that catchment, just as an example. Uh, other hard figures would be what is the benefit that water companies bottling water are getting uh, by the soil filtering that water and giving uh, good drinking water to all of us. So putting hard figures is what we need because this was the main criticism of most member states when we presented our impact assessment, uh, uh, Michael even so it was an excellent assessment uh, definitely. Uh, 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 because we, these are the figures that convince. If you come with estimates, uh, especially if the estimates are that wide in the plus and minus, it's very hard to be convincing. And so if there's any possibility in the future to improve our data collection system on economical, really economical, uh, hard figures on values, this would help us a lot. Thank you. Sam? Mm -hmm. Your reflection. Thank you. And uh, it's on the uh, global level, and if we look for the local level, we need um, uh, some approaches, uh, tools or um, incentive for the motivation people uh, for sustainable management of natural resource use that, it, that they have uh, such tools and uh, could uh, have uh, uh, real action against of degradation of land or soil. So, and of course, I fully agree that the um, uh, data is a very important issue, and especially in a mountain area, the lack of 
uh, necessary relevant debt data is so urgent, crucial issue and uh, of course to, uh, to, ha to have networking and to e exchange of experience is very important for mountain countries too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me close with uh, uh, two remarks and a word of thanks to our panelists. When we ask ourselves what the market value and the total value of land, I think uh, our panelists have touched on almost all of it except one aspect. Uh, that is uh, uh, the value derived because of uh, uh, financial uncertainty, the asset value. Um, uh, the more financial risk we have in the economic system, the higher de the demand for sort of quote-unquote secure assets. That's why the price of gold and the price of land have roughly developed in the same way over the last six years. So um, it's hard to separate the ecosystem's functions, the direct market production value of the land and the financial asset value of it. You cannot go to a farmer and observe the first and the third. You can only get at the first. At the second. You can only get at the second. Let's keep in mind that we need a holistic economic framework to get at the issue. Frankly, I take it from this session that, uh, yes, inside this room we must be um, uh, fully uh, focused on all complexities. Outside, we have to find ways to aggregate and simplify uh, in order not to confuse our main target group, investors and policy makers. A round of applause to our fabulous family.